Alicia here. We had some technical issues when we recorded today's interview, and we hope that the message still shines through even if we struggled a little with the medium. And we hope you enjoy. Greetings, friends, and welcome back to the podcast of Jewish Ideas, a Torah in Motion podcast. I'm JJ Kimchi. Philo of Alexandria, sometimes known as Philo Judaeus, was one of the most remarkable and prolific Jewish thinkers of the classical era. A broadly cultured and eclectic intellectual, Philo lived with one foot in the world of Greco-Hellenistic thought and another in the world of Jewish and biblical scholarship. Today, we shall be taking a tour of the ideas of this extraordinary thinker and the manner in which he tried to fuse these two great intellectual traditions. Joining us today is one of the world's preeminent scholars on the subject, Dr. Marin Niehoff, who holds the Max Cooper Chair in Jewish Thought at the Hebrew University of Jerusalem. Uh, Professor Niehoff is a member of the Israel Academy of Sciences and Humanities and has long been considered a leader in the fields of ancient Jewish studies. And one of her latest books, titled Philo of Alexandria, an Intellectual Biography, published by Yale in 2018, was considered a landmark work in this field. It is an honor to welcome Professor Niehoff to the podcast of Jewish Ideas Today. Professor, welcome. Yes, thank you very much. I'm extremely happy to talk to you about my ideas and about Philo. Exactly. What could be more exciting? Okay, um, let's jump in uh, first a little bit. And could you perhaps lay out a little bit of the historical context for us? So, um, you know, we're talking about uh, an ancient Jewish community in Alexandria, uh, first century of the common era. So what did that community look like? um, And what was their relationship to the Jewish community in the land of Israel? Yeah. Well, the Jewish community in Alexandria goes back um, much longer than, much earlier than Philo in the first century. And we don't know exactly how this happened and how um, Jews um, became such a thriving and big community in um, the city of Alexandria. But the greatest landmark that really is constitutive for the uh, Jewish community in Alexandria is a text called the Letter of Aristias, which sets out the most important aspect of um, the Jewish community there, and that's the translation of the Bible into Greek. So the letter by Asterius is probably written in the second century before the Common Era, and it tells the story, and it's a remarkable story because it um, claims that the um, Bible was in fact translated not for the needs of the Jews, as historically probably it was, but for the purposes of and the interests of the general audience. So the story goes that the huge library, kind of library of Congress in Alexandria in ancient times, um, they, the chief librarian noticed that they were lacking one of the major um, texts of world civilization, named the, the Torah of the Jews, and they also realized that it was written in a language that they could not understand, so why not try translated. And that's what they did. They brought people from the land of Israel and translated it. And this Greek translation called the Septuagint, um, following the tradition that 17 translators were involved in this project, um, has become the cornerstone, cultural, intellectual, religious, of Alexandrian um, Jews. And from that moment, it seems that the Alexandrian Jews no longer read the text in the Hebrew original. And all the texts that we have that somehow or other relate to the Bible, they always relate to the Greek translation and no longer to the, um, to the Hebrew text. Um, so this was a thriving community. It was situated in the metropolis of the ancient world, like kind of New York, um, with all the intellectual and cultural options open. And as today, already in antiquity, um, many Jews um, enthusiastically um, explored all the options that were um, open to them. The first university in the world actually um, was founded in Alexandria um, under the patronage of the the Ptolemaic kings. Um, The greatest library of the ancient world was in Alexandria. There was um, theater, um, 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 scholarship, medicine flourished. Um, So the Jews um, were quite a significant part of the population, um, took Um, part in all these options. And interestingly, we get a great diversity of Jewish voices from the beginning um, till um, 
philo, more or less, and we see that there were different different views and different approaches. Um, and philo is the one who stands out for his very close readings, again, of the Greek Bible and his commentary activity, um, systematic commentary, um, very close, looks very much like the Midrashim. Um, he's following each um, verse and raises a kushia, and then he gives an answer. And that's that's something that Philo uniquely contributed. We don't have that kind of commentary um, from Alexandria um, for that. Um, yeah, so, so that's very interesting. So before we d dive into, um, into the precise... You know, contours of Philo's uh, intellectual contributions. Uh, perhaps you could give us just a general overview of his life. Um, you know, so who was he? When roughly did he live? What did he do in his life? Um, and also, perhaps a you know a ten thousand foot view of uh, of his writings. What, what did he produce? Um, you know, what do we have that that we know was written by Philo? Well, my answer will be very short because we know very little about Philo's life. <laughs> um, he he didn't he didn't write very much uh, about himself. Um, so all that we can do is reconstruct some kind of central points from his own uh, writings. So roughly, he must have been born around um, 20 before the Common Era. He must have died around 50 of the Common um, Era. So in other words, when he dies, the Jerusalem Temple is still there. Um, and also Christianity was not yet a, a, a phenomenon that he would have noticed and taken you know, into consideration in his in his writings. The one key element that we do know about from his historical writings is the um, pogrom in Alexandria in 38, um, where the, the mob, the Alexandrian mob, entered the um, mostly the Jewish uh, quarters um, in Alexandria, and there was never a ghetto, that should be emphasized. Um, Jews living together out of their own um, cord and, um, and burned down uh, houses and they uh, killed people and they devastated um, uh, uh, property. And um, tragically, this has become, in Israel, um, again, very um, topical. And in fact, um, after, the, after October 7th, um, the first meeting we had with the students I read um, his description of the pogrom 2,000 years ago because that's the first description of a pogrom that we actually have. And, um, and the students were um, really um, shuddering to see how similar um, the description um, really is. Um, after that, um, Philo uh, left immediately as the head of the um, Jewish embassy to Rome. Um, so he immediately went to Rome and as the head of the Jewish embassy to negotiate the civic rights of the Alexandrian Jews. Um, and he met with Gaius Caligula, who was then the um, infamous Roman emperor, very much criticized not only by the Jews, but also by his Roman uh, peers. Um, and he, in fact, while Philo was in Rome um, and trying to meet him, Gaius announced that he would set up a statue of himself in the function of Zeus in the Jerusalem temple. And shortly after that, he was in fact assassinated for completely different reasons by Roman um, senators. And then Philo apparently stayed in Rome and he continued the negotiations with the, with the following um, emperor, that was Claudius, who came out with a famous edict in 41. Um, so that, that, that these are the kind of the main, the raw facts of um, Philo's life. Um, and um, his writings are extraordinary because there's no other writer in antiquity, whom I know at least, who used so many very different uh, genres, literary genres. So we have the systematic um, commentary um, with allegorical exegesis, where he goes from verse to verse and he assumes an in-depth knowledge of the Bible. And he can, like the rabbis, he often draws in other verses from other writings and he obviously assumes that people will know what he's talking about. So this is for a highly specialized Jewish audience who are familiar with the text and very eager on another interpretation of that particular verse, of that particular uh, kushia. Then he has historical writings where he describes the embassy, he describes also the, the, um, the, the, the reasons of, of the pogrom and the aftermath, the implications of it. Then he has philosophical writings, for example, about freedom. Um, he has, uh, and in addition, he has a 
huge series called the Exposition of the Law, which starts with the an account of the creation, goes uh, through the biographies of the patriarchs, and then gives us actually the first halachic writings where he explains the reasons for Jewish law observance in four volumes. So, um, extremely versatile author, and um, um, I think the reasons for his um, change of literary genre also has, to, in fact, to do with his um, biography, with his personal biography. Um, we'll get there in a moment. I do want to get there. Okay. Um, um, but, 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 but one important thing that you did say, and I think it's worth emphasizing, re-emphasizing for the audience's attention, is that he was an author. Um, and this is actually comparatively rare in the classical period, certainly within the Jewish tradition, because all the Judaic texts that we have at the time um, certainly the rabbinic tradition, these are all compilations, all the Mishnah, all the Midrash, these are all compilations of, of, of various traditions, you know, put together by unknown editors. Um, or we have other books or, or, you know, Apocrypha and Pseudepigrapha, which often we don't know who wrote them and we, or, or, you know, we don't really know anything about the, the authors of these uh, texts. But here we have, uh, for the first time, really, in, in Jewish history, a, a set, sets of books or, 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 or an author who writes in different genres and puts his own name and, and sort of... Um, confirms that he, in fact, is the man behind all of this. Um, and so you, you emerge, this is really the very first very deep intellectual personality to emerge in the entire history of the, the Jewish tradition, I would say. Um, um, he, I would qualify this a little bit. First of all, there seem to, there seem to in Alexandria, there were other Jews whose name we know, but we don't have their works anymore. So we have fragments of them, and it seems that they also put their names to their works. Um, so we have Demetrius, um, Aristobulus, um, and others who were not suit ep epigraphic writers, but actually put their name, only we lost their works um, due to the um, history of, of transmission. Then we also have Josephus, who certainly put his name um, proudly so to his, um, to his writings. And the last point that I would make is that perhaps also we have to look in rabbinic literature more carefully for traces that, in fact, also the rabbis continued this kind of Greco-Roman tradition of authorship and um, were perhaps less um, exclusively devoted to an oral tradition as we are used to think. So, for example, in the Jerusalem Talmud, there are these intriguing references to Rabbi Hoshaya as the Aviha Mishnah, the father of the Mishnah. And it's not yet clear in scholarship what that actually means. Did he write some sort of alternative version of the Mishnah? It's, it's not clear yet, but it's very intriguing to investigate whether perhaps also among the rabbis there was a slightly greater sense of authorship and personal writing then we are led to think through the compilations. Interesting. Um, Interesting. Okay. Um, uh, we'll get on to, to more of that. Um, let me ask you, I mean, to, to paint us, if possible, a very brief, or oh, sorry, uh, um, a broad overview of Philo's philosophical sympathies, because he's often classed as, or often grouped in with what are called middle Platonists. Um, and of course, he's living a few centuries after Plato, uh, but nonetheless, he describes a Platonic thinker, although of course he is, as I mentioned, one foot in the Jewish camp, one foot in the Greek camp. So, so if you give us just an overview of, you know, when it comes to, to, to broader philosophical themes, I mean, where does one place him intellectually? How does one describe him? Yes, so that's a very hot issue, and it's still um, debated among among scholars. Which is so there, why there's... I brought you on here to, to sort of to solve it once <laughs> and for all, you know. Um, so um, there is one group of scholars who thinks that in order to be a Platonist, you have to be pagan and you have to be a commentator on uh, Plato's dialogues. So if we take that kind of technical and rather narrow um, description, then Philo was not a Platonist because he was not pagan and he did not write um, commentaries on the dialogues, but on the Torah. Um, but I think that that um, description is actually far too narrow. And um, certainly when we move into the imperial period, and certainly if we also take into account later Christian thinkers, who people are very happy to describe as Platonists, for example, Clement of Alexandria or Origen, um, and none of them was pagan or commented on the dialogues. So I think there is um, room to actually think of Platonism um, in kind of broader uh, terms. Um, so I would say that Philo, particularly in his early writings, does qualify as a Platonist thinker, first of all, because he himself um, pledges, um, you know, loyalty to Plato. He quotes him, and he even says that he's a comrade on a common path. So what 
can you say more than that? And it seems to me that he did not um, see Plato and the Bible as contrast that he needed to bridge, but rather he felt that Plato brings out things and makes explicit some ideas that are in fact implicit in the Torah. So basically, you know, if you put it into biblical terms, then um, what um, um, Aaron was to um, to Moses, it, he, 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 he thought of Plato as a kind of a mouthpiece of, of, um, of Moses um, and um, bringing out these, these things that are actually already alluded in the, in the two in the Bible. Um, later in his life, he he became, and maybe what I should say, um, so what does, in terms of content, what makes him a Platonist? Um, so the first thing is a kind of a strong sense of a dichotomy between the material realm and the and the ideal realm, the, the mental, the intellectual uh, realm that pertains not only to the cosmos where you have the material cosmos as opposed to the higher realm of the ideas that can only be perceived by the mind and the logos um, and the body at the other end, but this also pertains to us human beings and the dichotomy within us between our bodily needs and our mind um, and so uh, uh, Philo adopted this basic um, platonic distinction and made great efforts like the Rambam later on to show that the biblical God was not anthropomorphic and that he did not have feelings, he did not have kind of bodily needs, he was not guided by um, anything that is less than absolutely um, spiritual. He also um, interpreted the biblical um, creation story as a, as a, as a story that um, shows us that man being created in the image of God pertains only to his intellect. We cannot um, entertain any idea of a resemblance between man and God other than uh, pertaining to the intellect. And um, so these, these are kind of basic ideas of um, Plato that Philo um, enthusiastically adopted and interpreted um, with regard to the Bible. Right. And of course, it is worth noting, um, once again, that this is in quite stark contrast to what was going on in the rabbinic world at the time. Because um, if you read you know, all the rabbinic corpus of the Mishnah or the Midrash or the Talmud, you will not find anywhere an explicit denial of God's um, corporeality or the, any explicit denial that God has you know, some kind of physical form. That comes later in Jewish thought. That comes, as you say, in the, in, in the medieval period with Rambam and with Sadia and with others who make this you know, a foundational point of Jewish theology, but not Hazar. Hazar never did this. And yet you have Philo, who was a contemporary of what we to call the earlier generations of Chazal, um, who, uh, uh, who who was who was he had already gone down this path of Platonizing essentially, um, and, got a, and, and stripping him of. You make a very your point is very interesting because I would say that the rabbis you're absolutely right the rabbis did not imagine the god as a completely transcendental abstract being and they had no problems with turning to a personal god. However, it seems that they also um, adopted the kind of basic Platonic dichotomy with with regard to men. So, for example, if you read Genesis Rabbah and you read there the creation uh, story of, of men, they also are very careful to distinguish between the kind of the higher function functions of men and the lower bodily ones. And there is even in, in Leviticus Rabba, there is even a story that tells us how the two were combined and um, that they should somehow go together. But you can see that also the rabbis lived at a time where this was an issue, an obvious issue that needed addressing. And some rabbis took a more conciliatory approach and others emphasized more the kind of the different aspects of man's life. But they seem to share this kind of general assumption, which is totally alien to the Bible, um, where nefesh really means has a kind of a physical connotation, can mean life, has nothing to do with an only spiritual um, element in us that is opposed to the body. And, and, and so the rabbis, it seems also they, they were in a post post um, platonic era um, where they also brought these ideas to um, to. Um, you know, to the Bible. Um, there was no going back to the kind of completely um, 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 holistic approach of the Bible. Right. In that respect. The, the truth is, I, I was careful to, to say, and, and always try to be when talking about the, the rising of Chazal, to, to say that we find no explicit evidence of it. Because the truth is that, as is well known, the, the, the rabbis generally didn't write in a very philosophical or theological vein. They sort of... Um, it, that wasn't wasn't really their style of expression uh, as much, and therefore um, harder to find systematic, as you know, 
systematic confirmation or denial or, or, or really thorough treatment in the manner that Philo would, because Philo was, in fact, a philosopher who, who, dealt, who dealt with these at greater length. Now, Philo also um, leads the way to um, rabbinic thought in a very interesting way, because I said that his, the Platonic phase um, of his thought really belongs to the, early, to the early stage, and later in Rome, he in fact changes his style quite thoroughly, and we see that he is... Um, and this is very relevant to the rabbis, because now he, he begins to do philosophy, not by kind of a theoretical speculation, but rather by transmitting um, characteristic sayings of um, uh, wise people. So he has a whole collection of sayings um, of Diogenes and others, and Moses included as well. And you see that the transformation from classical Athens, where indeed philosophy was done as a theoretical speculation in the form of dialogues and philosophical treatises, to the imperial period, when basically nobody any longer wrote dialogues, and the philosophical treatises were rather rare. So I would argue that Pirkei Avot in, in the Mishnah, the only non-Halachic um, tr- treatise, actually belongs precisely to this kind of contemporary philosophical discourse that was um, done by most other people as well, by way of collecting um, sayings of the wise. Um, and so I would not at all deny the rabbis a kind of a philosophical perspective. Um, certainly it was different from Plato, absolutely. Um, and it was also in some ways different from, um, from Philo. But they, they did have ideas and they expressed them in a mode that to contemporaries would have been absolutely um, normal. And perhaps one other aspect that I that we should mention here is that the only philosopher whom the rabbis mention is a certain Oinomaus of Gadara um, in today's Jordan, so very close by. And he was, in fact, a cynic philosopher. And the cynics were also famous for loathing theory. They despised any philosopher who went off into abstract um, thinking. And, in fact, their founder, Diogenes, is known to trample on the, on the, on the floor in uh, Plato's academy and accusing him of a completely useless um, approach that is up in the clouds and has nothing to do with ethical education. Um, so the rabbis mention um, Maus of Gadara quite often, and they seem to have felt that there is an affinity between um, kind of Jewish thinking, the way that they interpreted it, and um, cynic philosophy. Um, And the common denominator was that both schools didn't like um, theoretical speculation, and they um, both collected sayings of wise uh, men to illustrate um, the, 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 the lessons in a more kind of accessible way to wider audiences. That's fascinating. I, I did not know that. Um, of course, the other philosopher that is mentioned by name, although doesn't, it, although not denoting the actual philosopher himself, of course, in rabbinic writings is, is Epicurus, uh, whose name becomes the byword for heretic. And Epicurus is a heretic, and therefore Epicurus is given a sort of, um, you know, a dubious, a backhanded compliment, as it were, uh, of becoming the great example of, um, of, of you know. Uh, of an apostate or a heretic or someone who um, who believes in, in things that one mustn't believe. Anyway, um, but but you, you mentioned something there which I want to expand on because your book, one of the major um, innovations of your book or major theses that you posit is that Philo, the, the one very definite part of his biography that we do know, which is that he leads this delegation to Rome in 38. So you claim that this is a point of important philosophical turn within Philo's thought. Um, and that basically the pre-Rome Philo and the post-Rome Philo are actually quite different from one another, or at least that there is significant development. So, so what, does he, what does he learn in Rome? Um, and, and I would say more than that, how does this bear on his Jewish thinking or, or thinking regarding Jewish topics? Yes. So um, ancient philosophers, ancient diplomats were actually usually philosophers. And usually when they came to a place, usually the capital, um, they were there for a long time due to ancient um, modes of transportation and communication. So Philo uh, must have been in Rome for at least um, four years. And um, 
he used his time to talk to people. He started to talk to people. And since he was there defending the Jewish people, he had a, in, an obvious interest in finding out what public opinion was. He had an obvious interest in finding out what the Romans thought in order to make Judaism more understandable for them. And in fact, to speak in terms that would be familiar to them. And that's that's precisely um, what he um, did. Now, the Romans were not very keen on Plato because the Romans as well thought that he was kind of too abstract and he, he did, they didn't bother about him uh, very much. So they developed philosophies that were more down to earth, more practical, and also um, more geared towards the individual rather than to the state to, or to some kind of republic. Because remember, we are in the imperial age, but in any case, the emperor is deciding most of the things. Um, so the, there is an emphasis on the individual managing his or her life under these um, uh, circumstances. Now, I looked at Philo's very different um, works, and I realized that a, a large amount of them address people who have no idea about Judaism. Um, so, for example, in some of his works, he explains that there are um, five books in the Torah, and the first one is about the creation. Now, obviously, you don't need to explain such a thing to even a Jew who does not have a very deep education. Um, and um, he's explaining things to an outside audience. So this alerted me that, the, that, this, that he made a switch in audience from an intimate Jewish audience totally immersed in the biblical text to an audience that doesn't even know how many books there are in the Torah. Um, now, and this obviously has serious implications for what you will be discussing and what you will be talking about. Um, his later works are apologetic in the sense that they try to show Judaism in its best light and try to show that Judaism is based on values that are in fact also shared by um, other people in the Roman Empire. So that there is a place, a natural place, for Judaism and Jews in the um, in the um, in the empire. Now the Romans were also um, very interested in law, and uh, they were in fact famous for developing law schools and for establishing a system of jurisprudence, which in fact has um, influenced um, certainly most of um, today's um, states in, in Europe. They are still based on Roman law, um, in particular on uh, Roman um, civil um, law. Now, it seems that um, Philo and later also Josephus um, took advantage of that, and they actually realized that a large part, obviously, of the Torah is about law, and they um, used um, Roman discourses to think about it and to reflect about um, Jewish law and to categorize it in new ways that were not at all um, given in the, um, in the Bible. Um, so the Philo has a book on the Ten Commandments, and he has four books on the special laws of the Jews, which is kind of remarkable because he has um, tens of treatises in this earlier period for a Jewish audience, and there is only one tiny passage where he speaks about halacha. Um, and it's it's in, and there it, the, the most essential thing is that um, kind of law observance is kind of self-evident for Philo in these early writings, and there is not much need to think about it and to reflect about it and to develop kind of categories um, to um, make sense of the different types of laws um, that there are. This only comes in his Roman period when he um, um, has to, or when he feels that he should, in fact, explain Jewish law to a wider, um, to a wider audience. And then he comes up with a very interesting uh, concept, namely that the Ten Commandments are kind of the key um, and the basis for all the other for all the other laws, um, so he in fact he thinks and here he is kind of anticipating but also differing from Sadia, the first one who took it out, this issue up again in the Middle Ages, early Middle Ages. He actually thinks that all the mitzvot in Judaism they all have a rational basis. There's no such thing as as laws that you simply do out of obedience to God, as Saatya would uh, claim. But he thought that every single uh, mitzvah has roots in the Ten Commandments and thus also in a kind of an ethical rationale. Um, and from Philo's point of view, the, the ethical rationale actually uh, enforces 
the um, relevance and the importance of law observance, um, because then there is a better understanding of what um, what is um, in fact um, uh, needed. Um, so the the idea that you have um, a kind of the heads of the law and they are then subdivided into ever um, more detailed subcategories. This is, for example, a, a concept that we find in contemporary um, Roman law. Um, Sabinius um, was one of the first uh, leaders of the Sabinian school, and we only have fragments of his works, and it's very difficult to know exactly what he um, what he stood for. But one of the things that we have found in the fragments is the notion of heads, of kind of headlines, of head categories, of central um, uh, categories. And interestingly enough, Philo is also the first one who describes um, the Shabbat as a day of studying the law. And he says this is a day of um, kind of the synagogues, basically, as far as he's concerned, are kind of law schools. Um, which is a completely revolutionary concept because remember in the Bible the, the Shabbat is basically defined by abstention, namely in negative terms, right? Don't do this, don't do this, and then we have different lists in Exodus, in Deuteronomy, the, 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 the prophets add some further actions that should not be done. And Philo is in fact the first one who comes up with a positive definition of the Shabbat in the sense that he says you should be studying, and Moses in fact wanted us to study and to dedicate this whole day to the study of the law, which for him was equivalent to studying ethics. Um, and and this, this um, idea of a positive um, definition of the Shabbat is even echoed, you know, if you read um, Abraham Heschel's uh, nice little book, uh, Shabbat, he even mentions Philo um, as one of the first um, um, who came up with the idea that the that you should define the Shabbat in positive terms. And that's really Philo's um, incredible contribution, I think, to um, um, to the interpretation of, um, of Judaism, and the idea that the um, that you that you actually train Jews on the Shabbat to be law experts, I think, is something that he um, certainly he never mentioned anything like this in his early Alexandrian writings. And I think it's quite likely that he thought, "Oh, this is this is a wonderful idea, and it's so suitable to Judaism because we have so many um, legal um, treatises in the Bible." Um, so he must have thought that this is the most congenial thing, and therefore he thought that Moses had already, um, in fact, um, uh, commanded um, and installed the Shabbat for the study of the of the law to be to to render the Jews um, law experts. So there's, a lot, there's an enormous amount of fascinating uh, material there, and especially that after he went, after his delegation to Rome, it, I suppose it stands to reason that he, as it were, turned outwards and um, and sought to um, you know address a broader audience. Um, it, one element that you mentioned there, which is again worth emphasizing, is just how much or just to what extent Philo prefigures um, later Jewish thinkers, especially rationalist thinkers of the medieval period, right? So, uh, you know, over a thousand years later, you had people like Sadia or, or over a thousand years later, Rambab and others, um, many of whom are stating the same concerns as Philo, um, except interestingly enough, um, they had never heard of Philo because, and we'll get to this a bit later, but unfortunately, he was not at all picked up by the Jews um, and Jews had ne never heard of him and no idea of his writings. And it wasn't really until the 16th century that, that Jews picked him up again. And, as Ari Duras exactly in the 16th century, and then in the 19th century, they you know Jewish thinkers really started to pick Philo up. Um, but it's, it's amazing to think that you know Rambam and Sadia and and all the other rationalists reinvented, <laughs> reinvented yes, without realizing that they had a major you know forerunner, a forefather, a thousand years earlier and in Hellenistic Alexandria. They didn't know this, but they were repeating many of, of Philo's lines. Which I thought was it, it, it's just an extra, extraordinary thing to think about. There was this great thinker that was, you know, covered over by Jewish history and then, you know, unwittingly rediscovered and then centuries later actually rediscovered um, um, and, and placed back in the Jewish tradition. Um, well, well, so that makes it so special that Philo is integrated in your program. Oh, yes, no, absolutely. <laughs> he's, he's, in fact, yes. I mean, I really think that he, for whatever my opinion is worth, he should be reintegrated as a, a, a genuine you know, um, um, subject of Jewish study, those who want to study Judaic texts should turn to Philo as, you know, a real 
ancient commentator in the Bible, an ancient philosopher, an ancient, you know, real progenitor of Jewish thought in many ways, even if, uh, you know, even if his own writings were lost for many generations. Um, I, I do want to turn back to ask... Maybe I, I just want to add one one aspect here. I think it is quite possible that the um, that the rabbis, certainly those in Caesarea, like Rabbi Hoshaya, um, they, they had a pretty good um, control of of Greek, and I think it's quite likely that they that they did know Philo, um, uh, partly because we know for certain that his books were in the library in Caesarea because Origen, the church father, brought them there. Now there is always the assumption that if the Christians liked him, then probably Jews would turn their back on him precisely for that very reason. Um, but it seems to me um, that there is also a possibility that there was a kind of a competition between some of the rabbis who were immersed in Greek learning and and the Christian exegetes, um, you know, um, who could lay claim to this enormous heritage of Hellenistic um, Judaism. And some of the um, interpretations of Hoshaya to, to Genesis look very much as though he had some kind of idea what Philo um, was doing. So it, it, it is a possibility that, that he did, in fact, um, know, but obviously he didn't mention it, and thus there is no trace of it that we can actually... Um, so we'll get on to the, the um, biblical exegesis in a moment, because I do want to discuss it. But I, I do want to stay on this theology uh, point that we mentioned earlier for a little bit, which is, you know... Just want to nail down the elements of Philo's theology because, as you said, so one element was that God is entirely um, transcendent. Transcendent, exactly. No, he cannot be described. or cannot be. Uh, no physical properties can be ascribed to him. No spatial dimensions or anything like that. Um, are there any other elements of Philo's theology which um, you know f- f- a are important for the development you know of, of later Jewish thought, but also um, which mark him out as different, let's say, from other Platonists at this time. Uh, you know, mark him out as more Jewish, or mark him out as someone concerned with with the God of the Hebrews as opposed to simply the God of Plato. And how did he negotiate that? Um, so I think a crucial element in Philo's theology, as later also in Sadia and uh, Maimonides, is the notion of a creator God. Um, the Jewish God is the one who created the world, and he was um, concerned to create the best possible world, um, and he also did so for the benefit of mankind, um, right? So, so the world is ac- actually equipped with all the things that men would later um, need. So that that's really a pillar of um, Philo's theology. And interestingly enough, also this very Jewish, essentially Jewish um, pillar also is in dialogue with um, Greek philosophy because the late Plato wrote a also a dialogue called the Timaeus, which was also about the creation of the world. And Plato, in his later years, when he became slightly less transcendental, he also thought that the, the, there should be a bridge between the um, good God and the world. And he came up with a, the idea that the creator God looked at the ideal cosmos and in the image of the ideal cosmos, he created the material cosmos, which we know. And this explains why the cosmos that we live in is relatively good, even though it is uh, material. Now, Philo knew Plato's Timaeus, and he read the Timaeus in line with the chapter one of the book of Genesis. And he also adopted the idea that you can only have a good world if it is modeled on some ideal and not on something material. Um, so this, so far, again, he, we see that he's a good Platonist, but then he kind of changed it a bit. And he introduced the idea that the ideal cosmos, uh, which in the Timaeus the Demiurge looks at, as it were, from afar, was in fact also created by the, by God himself. Um, so Philo introduces the idea of the Logos, um, and that's where the place in kind of God's mind where he first created the um, um, spiritual or intellectual cosmos, and then in the image of that, he created the material um, world. Now, interestingly enough, Philo uses an image of the architect to um, show exactly the specific specific details of this idea. And he says, you know, just like an architect doesn't just go out and build anything but plans, thus also God first created the plan and then he created um, the, the material world, two steps. Um, and kind of comparing God to an architect, 
but on the other hand, is also something kind of describing it in very human terms, um, and also describing him in terms that were very familiar to the ancient to the ancient um, pagans. And it is precisely on this very point where later Christian um, thinkers um, parted ways. So they no longer wanted to accept the idea of God being similar to an architect. And they also insisted that um, God cannot be kind of an architect using materials that were around, the Tova Vo or some other materials, um, but he can only be described properly as a creator God if we assume that um, he created everything from nothing. So that's creatio, it's an ex nihilo. And Philo, as also the Bible, um, was still completely innocent of such an idea. And he thought that the, um, that the creation is beautiful, is perfect, um, by turning um, primordial materials into the best possible, into the best possible world. Thanks. It is, of course, interesting to note that this notion of God as an architect uh, is also a rabbinic notion as well. In fact, the very first yes. midrash in Breshit Rabbah um, has um, the line, Kach haya, Kach haya, uh, mabit batorah, uvara'at olam, that God sort of looked in the Torah, the Torah representing this kind of um, idealized blueprint, as it were, for the world, and, and, and created the world out of what he saw in the Torah, which is... I, I suppose that you see, and this is exactly Rabbi Hoshaya who makes um, who offers that uh, midrash. And uh, scholars, for example, like Bacha, one of the first uh, the founders of Jewish scholarship in the late 19th century, he thought that was an example where Hoshaya may have, in fact, used Philo. Um, and then instead of speaking about God's logos, um, he exchanges that for the for the Torah. And if you remember the, the midrash um, precisely, you will also note that Hoshaya. Uh, at the end, he concludes and says, "Ein rishit ela Torah." There is no beginning except the Torah, and it's kind of really interesting that his um, contemporary, the Christian exegete Origen, um, also interpreted the Greek version of, of uh, the creation account. And he, guess what? He said, uh, "The beginning is the Logos, is Jesus." Um, so we can see here that Hoshaya may have engaged not only with Philo's ideas, but also phrased his midrash in a way that gave a response to the contemporary Christian claim and made it very clear that Ein Rishit El Torah, which also implies the beginning is not the Logos, neither in the sense that Philo thought of it, nor in the sense that now Origen thinks of it, and connecting it via the Gospel of uh, John to uh, to Jesus. Um, yes. Right. So that, that, that's a fascinating, I suppose, an intriguing possibility of Philo's texts somewhat infiltrating to some of the rabbis, you know, as you say, living in Caesarea or some of these slightly more open cities where you would have had these texts in the libraries, integrating it you know, to a small degree into some of their midrashic material, but um, I, I suppose being lost or overwhelmed in the sea of other rabbinic writings, which which weren't Philonic, uh, you know, a, a, as a rule. Um, so I want to jump into uh, Philo's biblical exegesis, because this is the sort of the one thing that people tend to know about Philo. You, you say Philo's then they say, ah, yes, he gave an allegorical uh, interpretation to large parts of, of the Chumash, of the um, of the five books of Moses. So, I, I mean, I wanted to ask, you know, firstly, if you could describe the sort of thing Philo does, and maybe even, if possible, take us through a specific example. So, you know, I, I, I recall reading recently of, of his uh, readings of a the stories of Abraham. So Abraham leaving his father's house, mm -hmm. or Abraham, you know, sacrificing Isaac, and these, these things in a very... Not sacrificing Isaac. <laughs> so, sorry, yes, no. Being correct. willing. Almost sacrificing Isaac. <laughs> willing, willingness to sacrifice. Yes, correct. That is a very important... Um, a, a, a very important <laughs> correction. Um, but yes, yeah, so, so, so Philo has, you know, highly allegorical and philosophical reading. So could you perhaps describe it to us and then maybe give us one or two um, specific examples? What does Philo do with the biblical text? Yes. Um, so allegory obviously um, was a, an, an established Greek method of interpretation um, and Philo used it, but he used it in a completely new sense. Allegory had been mostly used beforehand by the Stoics and they used it to defend the Homeric um, epics and um, as far as they were concerned, the allegory, in fact, replaces the, the um, canonical text. So instead of thinking of the um, um, pagan gods as, um, you know, killing each other or whatever, you can you have a kind of a replacement um, philosophical reading of that, and then um, that is 
the the meaning of the of the verse of the Homeric um, verse, and the Stoics also uh, were very keen on um, kind of natural science to integrate natural science into their allegories and to and to show that all the stories, all the mythologies about the gods really pertain to processes in nature. Now, Philo took a completely different approach. First of all, um, he, he's interested, as we already said, in Platonic ideas. So his the content of his allegories very often resonate with Platonic philosophy and ethics rather than with natural science. But more importantly, he felt that Moses, in fact, had intended the allegorical meaning not as a replacement, but as a a supplement. So um, Philo was very keen on keeping the literal and the allegorical side by side. And this, of course, also has enormous uh, implications for his um, notion of law observance, because he insisted that you can un very well understand some metaphorical, allegorical, or whatever spiritual meanings of the mitzvah, but at the same time, the literal is in fact in, um, in effect and should be um, should be observed. So how did Philo claim that Moses already intended us to have an allegorical understanding of his own text, um, which of course is not explicitly stated in any <laughs> anywhere in the Bible? So how could Philo make that claim? Well, he said um, Moses um, kind of introduced difficulties in the text, kushia, things that are on the face of it, um, not very plausible, or they seem to contradict other things that uh, Moses has said. And then, um, seeing that Moses was a perfect author who would not have written just a flaw, flawed text, we must actually take those um, difficulties as a springboard for um, further contemplation, and that's also for an allegorical um, meaning. In a way, it is the kind of the method of Rabbi Akiva, who took every single thing, um, vav or whatever, in the text, and said, well, there is an additional meaning to it. So that, that in a way, is what Philo, um, what Philo um, did, um, thinking that Moses already guided us into this kind of realm of different, um, of different um, meanings. Now, you mentioned already Abraham, Abraham's migration. Philo dedicated the whole book to Abraham's um, migration. And um, he interpreted the different steps of his journey as different steps in our kind of intellectual um, awareness. So as it were, Abraham moved from idolatry to ever higher um, um, intellectual um, stages until fully recognizing um, the uh, mono monotheistic um, uh, God, which of course is also an explanation of how come that Abraham listened to the God who told him, Lech Lecha, you know, go from here without God having really introduced himself. So Philo, in a way, uh, provides that introduction from the point of view of Abraham moving up into these higher realms and realizing that there was a force in the universe that held everything um, together and will hold everything together um, um, forever. Um, other allegories, some less um, um, palatable to a modern mind. So, for example, he interprets Adam and Eve in, in the garden as um, the, the male representing the rational mind and the female the senses. Um, and obviously there is a value um, um, attached to this. Um, and obviously the, the mind is superior to the, um, to the female um, sense um, uh, perception. Um, the rivers of, pa of paradise are interpreted, for example, allegorically as the cardinal virtues, um, um, prudence, courage, um, temperance and fortitude. And here again, you can see a very nice combination of, on the one hand, reading the Bible very carefully, and then on the other side, kind of engaging with larger um, and broader discourses, because the cardinal virtues were embraced by, basically by all the different schools. And so there is another implicit message here that uh, Moses when he kind of meant us to understand the um, rivers in paradise as the cardinal virtues, he also, in fact, meant us to join um, the world at large and share their virtues and recognize that we are, in fact, very similar um, to them. And each of the different groups kind of gets the same values on, on their in their particular way. Um, 
kind of in, in a way a bit a kind of an enlightenment idea that, you know you can have different ways to the to the same truth interesting and um and i mean this is perhaps is an obvious question but it's still worth sharpening which is okay so to what degree was Philo different, or in what ways is Philo different? Because he clearly is quite different to to let's say other midrash that was going on in his time that we that we have access to. In other words, the, the, the earlier midrashic corpuses that have been collected. Um, so we have some, especially the halachic midrashim, and yet they they are not quite as alleg- allegorical, or they very much mute their allegor- allegorization, I suppose, of the psukim. So I mean. Very broadly, because I know there's a, a very rich field of study and many have devoted an enormous amount of text to this, but, but the essential differences in, let's say, exegetical tendencies between Philo and, uh, and the Midrashim of his time. Now, I guess the first really important thing we have to notice is that the Mishnah actually contains biblical interpretation. The Mishnah is remarkably independent. And that's, by the way, also why Abraham Geiger liked it so much. And he thought this was a real kind of a reform document because it does not um, hide itself, as he put it, um, behind the verses, but kind of comes out and states its rules um, independently and very and very clearly. Uh, so the, the kind of the foundational document of rabbinic Judaism is remarkably um, um, free of biblical um, interpretation. And this um, concerned many of the subsequent um, rabbis. And we can see that there is an effort, in fact, to, you know, the, the, the main project of the halachic midrashim is basically to bring everything that has been said in the, in the Mishnah and connect it back to the biblical um, to the biblical. Um, to the biblical verses, and to show how the Mishnah perhaps derived um, its rulings from the biblical text, or vice versa, how the rulings that have already been installed can now be harmonized with the biblical with the biblical text. And I think this is one of the main tensions that we see go through all of rabbinic literature from the land of Israel, um, because, for example, the Tosefta that comes directly after the Mishnah, and this is the first kind of commentary on the Mishnah, um, does, is not yet disturbed by the fact that the Mishnah is so free. And it continues in this freestyle to think through the different rules and to bring more examples from life and to think through this. But there is no anxiety um, that there is no biblical interpretation. There is no um, uh, um, systematic effort to um, coordinate the Mishnah with the um, with the Bible. That we see in the halachic midrashim, and we also see that already incorporated in the Jerusalem Talmud. Very often, you see the Jerusalem Talmud quote something from the Mishnah to. To, to interpret it, but then it really draws on the halachic midrashim, which did already the work of, of coordinating the Mishnah with the, with the biblical text. So why did I mention all this? Because we see in Philo as well um, the two completely different strategies. In his, early, in his early Alexandrian time, as I said, he has a um, systematic commentary, but in his later writings, the, the Bible is very much in the background. He appeals to it from time to time, kind of like the Mishnah, but he doesn't he doesn't write in terms of a systematic commentary. So um, Philo shows us the two ways that were so foundational for Judaism, namely kind of writing with the Bible in a freestyle or commenting systematically every single verse, every single word. Philo has both of them, and we see that the tension between the two is something that is really foundational to the whole project of rabbinic Judaism. And you see different documents and different rabbis um, opting for different um, versions of this, of, the, of these two um, possibilities. Now, in terms of um, systematic Bible commentary, I would say that Philo is the first one who really shows us the Midrashic type of commentary, um, because he's the first one who quotes the biblical text. Remember, all the other Jews in the Second Temple period, except the Pesha Qumran from uh, uh, from Qumran, Pesha Habakkuk from Qumran, um, they don't quote explicitly. They kind of paraphrase and rewrite the biblical um, text. And Philo and the rabbis do quote the text, 
And both of them, unlike Pesha Habakuk from Qumran, they allow for diversity of opinions. And that's a very important criteria of a kind of a scholarly approach. Um, because in, in Pesha Habakuk from Qumran, you have only one interpretation, and the one interpretation is revealed by God himself. Um, so there is no discussion and no diversity of opinions and certainly no machloket. You know, there is no debate. And in Philo and the rabbis, you get different opinions. <laughs> And you get um, a kind of an explicit definition of what the kushia is, and then you get the different um, exegetes to work really hard to show that their solution is the right one on philological grounds, on comparison of verses, on um, logical thinking, but they have to show you that their interpretation is in fact the right one. And still you end up being able to choose from a variety of um, options that have been offered to you. And, and I think these, these pillars of, of commentary are something that really um, um, unite um, Philo and the rabbis, and I think it also shows that they were both part of, of, a, of a larger world where, in fact, also um, debate and diversity of opinion were, you know, they were, that was the part of the game of, the, of being intellectual and of being um, an educated person who could articulate, on the one hand, their own views, but also um, kind of respectfully discuss the views of others and take them into consideration. And that's fascinating because I started off the question by assuming there was this great gulf between Philo's uh, method of exegesis and the rabbis. And essentially what you're claiming is that actually, especially when compared to the Pesha Chabakuk of Qumran, which I actually happened to, uh, I, I was... I learned it last night in, in a study group, in a weekly study group that I have. Oh. <laughs> and I actually, I have to think, and, and what's the truth of Habakkuk, among other things, is that it's, um, the biblical interpretation is very, I would say, contemporary and political for them. In other words, yes. it refers directly to their group and applied directly to their leader, the, the Moritz Hedek, and et cetera. Whereas, um, I suppose, in Philo and Chazal, it, it's much more conceptualized. And it's, it's talking, you know, uh, grander and broader themes. And certainly for Philo, the biblical text can be read in a manner as to, you know, how to inculcate a correct philosophical education or how to acquire the great virtues that are necessary, et cetera, et cetera. And that's, that is, of course, much more universal and much more applicable. I think the, the Qumran type of kind of applying the biblical text uh, uh, word for word to your own group or to your own time is, is something that we see um, is Jesus is doing in the New Testament. And that's something that is very prominent in early Christian um, exegesis. And it's, it's not at all uh, present in, in, among the rabbis and certainly not in, in final. And you can sometimes even see, you know, the, the kind of the problem that they, that they, the very detailed kind of specific problem that they find in the, in the biblical text is sometimes even shared, I mean, literally shared by the rabbis and by, um, and by fine. You know, they, they come, they, they, they are aware of exactly the same nuances in the, in the text. Fascinating. Um, I so I, before we before we end, there are a couple of questions we have to get to. Um, one of them is the question of um, reception and influence of Philo, because as I alluded to earlier, there's this curious fact of intellectual history, which is that Philo was almost universally ignored. In fact, universally ignored among Jewish authors, Jewish texts, not mentioned by the Gaonim or by the Rishonim or by the by the Babylonian Talmud, the Jerusalem Talmud. He's, he's just completely absent. Um, and the first person who does dig him up again is a 16th century Italian uh, philosopher and, and historian called Azario de Rossi, or Azario Minho Adumim, um, in his Maori name. Um, however, so, so how do we have Philo today? The answer is that he was preserved and venerated by the church fathers, by the early Christian thinkers, the, the great canonical Christian thinkers, who saw him as a major... Historical writings, and I think that he also may have read some of his exposition of the law, because Josephus has in his Contra Pionim, he has a kind of a, the beginning of, um, of a kind of an account of Jewish law, and some of this is very similar to what Philo does. So I, I think that he probably had, was inspired by Philo to do that. And then, again, the rabbis we have already um, um, spoken about. Um, once we move to the Babylonian Talmud, we see, I mean, the, the, the Babylonian rabbis were completely removed already from the whole Greco-Roman 
world. And that included also um, Philo, and it, it includes also a kind of a, a difficulties in understanding the things, the discussion that are going on in the Jerusalem Talmud, in the in the Midrashim. You know, they, they just find it very difficult to, to understand it because they are so removed. They don't know Greek and Latin anymore. And um, so I'm not at all surprised that they would not take an interest in this um, Jewish author who spoke a language they were absolutely not um, familiar with and didn't think it worthwhile um, studying as part of their whole kind of rejection of the Greco-Roman uh, world, which the Palestinian rabbis were very much at home in and embraced um, to, to a large extent. And um, we have earlier spoken about uh, Roman law and Roman notions of law being embraced by Philo and to some extent also by Josephus. And I mean, that's the major project also of the rabbis, of the Palestinian rabbis in the land of Israel um, who, who continued that sort of project. Now, the second part of your question, um, why did the um, Christians love him so much? Um, well, first of all, they were it's, it's a very particular kind of Christian author who liked him. And these were basically um, uh, authors who had a close connection to Alexandria and the, and the world of Alexandrian learning, including uh, Platonic um, philosophy, and a vested interest in Bible exegesis. Um, so, it's, um, so it's a selection. It's a very particular group of Christian um, authors who, um, who did, in fact, embrace him. And thought that he was a kind of a predecessor for them in translating uh, the biblical notions into more spiritual terms, as they um, thought. The, the relationship um, between these Christian um, writers and Philo is, is a complex one. It's not just one of a kind of a, a love story without any qualification. Um, because they, first of all, they used him in many respects um, for, for the allegorization of the, the scriptures. Um, it, it's a very selective um, use. For example, they did not take his historical or halachic writings um, into account at all. And it is always with the, on, the, on the condition that Philo was a kind of a, a predecessor also in the understanding, in, in, a, in a kind of an appreciation of Jesus being the fulfillment of all of this. I found that the... Um, the Christian author who really does most justice to Philo is Eusebius. He was also active mostly in Caesarea, the first uh, church historian. And he um, speaks about Philo in a very respectful way. He acknowledges his um, Judaism. He speaks of him as a Jewish author, unlike, for example, Origen, who never mentions that he was a Jewish author, and hardly ever mentions Philo's name. We can only reconstruct his heavy use simply by comparing the texts. But Origen is not um, very forthcoming in praising Philo. He keeps all his writings. He takes many motifs but he does not um, praise him very much and he does not account for his um, Jewish identity. Um, later on um, in the fourth century, Eusebius does account for Philo's Jewishness. He respects it and he constructs him as an intellectual among the Jews who went kind of into a more universal um, direction. And he also uh, thinks that his work on the Therapeute, a group of um, Jewish uh, philosophers near Alexandria, was in fact a, an account of the early Christians. And this is kind of really interesting because he, he kind of envisions Philo as a Jew portraying these early Christians in a kind of sympathetic um, way without, however, subscribing to what he considered their Christian ideas. And the key word for Eusebius to make that claim is the fact that the Greek text, Philo's Greek text, mentions the monasterion, the place of solitude, where the therapeute would go to do their contemplation. So Eusebius could not think of a monasterion without the Christian connotations. And that's why he figured that um, Philo must have been describing a group, the earliest group of, of Christians um, in uh, near, um, near Alexandria. Eusebius was also the first one who actually catalogued all the works of Philo that he knew. And it is thanks to Eusebius that we know of some titles that, um, that of, of works that have been lost. He um, had, had a very um, respectful and, and good um, attitude. But ironically, 
by comparison to origin, he used him less. Um, he used him less um, because he didn't, you know, Eusebius did not write the kind of commentary on the book of Genesis that um, Origen wrote. So he had less use for him in his kind of practice. And certainly he was not so useful for him for his history of the church. Um, but he had this account of him and his and, and explanation how the Christian church can actually rely on an early Jewish interpreter who wanted to be Jewish and was proud of being Jewish um, and at the same time provided some really useful ideas for Christian exegesis. Interesting. Um, so, so one final question I think I would ask, which is uh, relates to a theory proposed by one of the great Philo scholars of the last century, the 20th century, is Harry Austin Wolfson. Right? So Harry Austin Wolfson was, um, uh, you know, was a professor at Harvard. He was one of the great intellectual historians of the 20th century. He wrote an enormous amount about an enormous amount. He really one of the one of the great um, sort of catalogers of, of medieval and ancient ideas, really that ever existed. Um, and he wrote a fat two volume work on Philo, an extraordinarily impressive work. And basically, he actually made a set of very grandiose claims for Philo in his mind. Philo was the inventor of all of medieval philosophy. So basically, Harry Osramov said that philosophy can be, um, can, the history of philosophy can be divided into three, the ancient period, the medieval period, and the modern period, and that the ancient period was just the pagan, the Greek um, tradition, let's say. Um, and the whole medieval period of philosophy, according to, to Wilson, was the the attempt to, to fuse Greek philosophy with the Hebraic scriptures. Right with the uh, with the Old Testament and then later the New Testament, he said that basically the entire um, and later on the Quran. So according to, to Wolfson, the entirety of the fifteen hundred years of medieval uh, philosophy from Philo to Spinoza was an attempt by Jews, Christians, and Muslims to apply the the ancient the, the Greek philosophical tradition to their particular holy scriptures and holy texts and to sort of fuse and explain one in the light of the other. Um, and and uh, and until Spinoza came and basically finally and conclusively divorced religion from reason and said that actually, you know, restored the crown of philosophy back to its back to its perch, divorced it from scripture. So Wolfson made the extraordinary claim that basically after Philo for about 1500 years, nothing new happened, right? In other words, for him, Philo basically set the template that you have these scriptures and you have to interpret them in the light of this Greco uh, philosophical tradition. Um, and, and and that's it. And that was what people did for 1500 years. So obviously this theory uh, has been much contested, but I mean, what do you make of it? Do you see in Philo the progenitor, the the father really of, of the entire medieval philosophical endeavor? Well, first of all, I'm speaking to you from the Widener Library where um, Wolfson must have worked and perhaps even wrote his two um, volumes on, uh, on Philo. It is one of the first books uh, of scholarship that was also translated into Hebrew. So in, in fact, in Israel, uh, Harry Wolfson's work has a long tradition and is very much um, respected and is still in many ways the handbook that is used um, for Philo, unlike his original, the original version of his, um, of his um, work. I'm, I am hesitant um, to think that Philo had a great historical influence. So in that sense, I wouldn't see the kind of philosophy after him as footnotes to Philo. Um, but I and but I follow Wolfson in his great appreciation of Philo, and I have kind of. Co Coined the term um, compass or key, because I think without claiming um, Philo's direct influence on all these um, authors, um, he does surely illustrate and he opens up a tremendous amount of intellectual history simply because he dealt with such an enormous amount of issues and dealt with them in such a sophisticated manner that set the tone for for his time. And so I, I am very fond of using Philo to open and understand the New Testament, the rabbis, um, Christian philosophy and, and theology. And um, I just don't bother about the historical dependence because I think it can in any case not be proven. So I think the more fruitful step forward, which I hope Wolfson would have liked, is to actually say, yes, Philo was incredibly important at, at a crucial point in the development of Western civilization, right, early first century, um, writing just before the New Testament, writing just before so many other important thinkers 
put their um, pen to the paper. And um, Philo can actually is crucial to understand all these um, subsequent um, developments precisely because they attempt similar things or address similar um, problems and often attempt very similar um, solutions, in fact. And then Philo can, can actually be a compass to really see what they have done, how they achieved it, where they differed, and also perhaps um, illuminate the, the problems with their solutions um, in, in comparison to what um, Philo, um, Philo has done. Well, I think we'll have to leave it there. Um, this has been a wonderfully enlightening conversation. Professor Nihoff, thank you so much for joining us on the podcast of Jewish Ideas. And uh, we look forward to, uh, to studying further and, and to delving deeper into Philo. And um, really, this, is, this has been a great pleasure. Thank you very much. This has been the podcast of Jewish Ideas by Torah in Motion, produced by Alicia Kelman and myself, JJ Kimchi, edited and mixed by Alicia Kelman. You can stay up to date by subscribing in your favorite podcast app. To support more thoughtful Jewish content like this, please visit torahinmotion.org slash donate.